so placental dysfunction, that's my talk today, the management prevention of placental dysfunction, represents the reduced capacity of this organ to carry all the things that the baby needs so uh, the pregnant woman can feed the baby through the placenta. There are several forms of manifestation, like fetal growth restriction, that's the first one, the main, uh, the most common form of presentation, oligohydramnios, abnormal Doppler studies, and obviously preeclampsia, because the preeclampsia is the maternal uh, expression of the placental dysfunction. Uh, it's one of the obstetric manifestations of antiphospholipid syndrome. Uh, I, I do not need to go the criteria for this, uh, this group that's over here, uh, but what we need to know is uh, we don't have a generally uh, some kind of criteria that's uh, over-accepted in the obstetric field. This is one of the criteria that was created by Ware Branch that I agree with most of them, but we can all argue if that's the best one or if that we can expand or we can reduce the definition. So uh, going back to the obsessed field, the definition of fetal growth restriction is the fetus that is failing to reach its genetically predetermined growth potential. It's very broad. And then if you go to ACOG, it says this, the, the definition for fetal growth restriction is very simple. It's a fetus that has uh, estimated fetal weight on the ultrasound or abdominal circumference less than the 10th percentile for the gestational age. So when you, have the, when you have this broad definition, we can put a lot of babies that are, they are not sick, but we get them uh, inside this definition. If you get the International uh, Society for Ultrasound of, in Obstetric and Gynecology, they have a more uh, uh, specific criteria, and then they have the uh, differentiation between early fetal growth restriction and late fetal growth restriction and they go for the third percentile or the 10th percentile with Doppler abnormalities. When we have these like more deep and more, uh, with more specificities uh, criteria, you can also leave some babies that are sick not included in this criteria. So we can look on both sides and then we can lose some babies that we are not looking as sick or we can get normal babies and call them sick. And that's a problem that we have in the obstetric field so far. Uh, I want to point some things before going specifically to the prevention. Uh, when we say about the early uh, fetal growth restriction, we in the obstetric field we use 32 weeks as definition for preeclampsia is 34, so it doesn't matter very much. What I want to say with this slide is that when we talk about APS, we are thinking about the first part, the early uh, fetal growth restriction, because that's when we have high prematurity and high pregnancy lost. But when you have late uh, fetal growth restriction, the problem is just management. We have a low mortality, and we don't care that much for APS. It's not very specific, especially when you are talking about classification criteria and studies. So we are looking for the early ones that they are going to have problems for the baby. And when also when we think about the etiology of uh, fetal growth restriction, that's from the ACOG, the American College of Obstetric and Gynecology. Of course, antiphospholipid syndrome is the middle of the box, but we have a lot of other causes, and uh, sometimes they overlap, and so we obstetricians have to rule out a lot of things. It's just a reminder that we have a lot of other causes. We, we just saw uh, some talk about uh, aneoplities and genetic abnormalities cause of fetal loss. We have the same thing for fetal growth restriction. Considering uh, placental dysfunction in APS, it has been described in 15 to 40 percent of patients with APS, even after treatment, patients with thrombosis have increased the risk for fetal growth restriction. And there's a considerable uh, overlap with preeclampsia. And we have to remember that hypertensive disorders are the main cause for placental dysfunction. We have to uh, exclude other causes, but sometimes it's impossible because more than one factor can be present, as I showed before. And this, there are a small number of studies considering fetal growth restriction. Most of them are looking for fetal loss and preeclampsia. There are different definitions, like I said before. And uh, we have the traditional and variation and lack of repeated testing when we are looking for studies. I think the best one was made by Professor Branch, that's here. Uh, he looked for patients with premature delivery, 36 weeks or less, 
with preeclampsia placental sufficiency. It's a case control study, and he found 11% of the patient had positive APL. So it's a high number we can consider looking for APL in patients that have a premature preeclampsia or placental sufficiency. However, we have to remember that 90% of the patients doesn't have, don't have uh, APL positivity. Just another reminder, it's a study about uh, placental malperfusion uh, in patients with APL. Uh, I know the numbers are small, but it's not the point of the slide, uh, because we can have infarction in placentas of patients with APS, but we can have in patients with fetal growth restriction as well. And even in the controls, the control group has infarction, and the control group also has fetal, uh, vascular thrombosis. So these findings in placentas uh, of thrombosis and also infarction do not mean APS. We can also have unfetal growth restriction. These, these are pictures of baby with fetal growth restriction that have nothing to do with APS. The lack of small vessels, that's what we see every day on obstetric fields. So uh, be careful with placentas when, because the, the placenta of a patient with a baby with fetal growth restriction is very similar to APS and sometimes we cannot make the difference. So going to the prevention, uh, the low dose aspirin is the main form of prevention that we have uh, in the obstetric field. We have to start it before 16 weeks according to this meta-analysis. It's a very huge one, very important one for or, for the obstetricians. Uh, this is a reminder because sometimes I see rheumatologists having a patient that is using warfarin, and when she gets pregnant, they just tend to heparin and forget the low dose aspirin. So please remember, even if she doesn't have a high thrombotic risk, low dose aspirin is, is important for us for prevention of preeclampsia and also fetal growth restriction. Uh, however, like I said, uh, even with the treatment, we can have sometimes almost 30, 40% of fetal growth restriction. That we can have two conclusions. That's not working as well for patients with APS, or if we don't use that, we can reach like 15, 6%, or something like that. We don't have the right answer for so far, we use low dose aspirin in all patients. Consider heparin, we use it every time. However, uh, this meta analysis using uh, evaluating uh, low molecular weight heparin to prevent placenta mediated pregnancy complications. It was eight trials almost 1,000 patients, 42% uh, with thrombophilia, which is probably very weird, probably inherited thrombophilia were included. But uh, the point is, even using heparin to prevent this kind of events, it did not work. So if the patient has some kind of features that should, that reminds of APS, but the tests are negative, adding heparin it is not going to help. To help. And we are not sure if heparin is happy, uh, helping these patients with APS. We have to use that for thrombosis and everything, but maybe it's not working for placental dysfunction. We have a hydroxychloroquine. Uh, we have to remind uh, a very interesting study from the brand group um, from New York that APL can break the annexin 5 shield that protects the trophoblast. And then with the break of the shield, you can have inflammation uh, all over the place and bring in uh, a lot of uh, macrophages uh, and everything that goes inside the trophoblast, making it dead. dead. But if we add uh, hydroxychloroquine to this patient, we can like fix the shield. So it's a small study that is an in vitro study, but it has some potential to protect the trophoblast and we have to remind that the, the patient that's, the baby that's not growing, the placental dysfunction is due to the trophoblast or the placenta that's not growing, uh, growing well. This study for Maria Laura Bertolacini, in vivo and in vitro studies with mouse models of obstetric KPS, they had a previous studies uh, showing that it was association of APL and complement activation in placental insufficiency, and they, they add hydroxychloroquine to the, the mouse and the in vitro studies. It sh was shown to inhibit binding of C C on Q, C1Q and cleavage of C3, and there was no pathogenic effects in placenta of the mice. So this is a potential look, uh, potential prevention of placental sufficiency with hydroxychloroquine uh, that was shown in this study. 
There are controversial studies in SLE if it's uh, reducing the incidence of fetal growth restriction, uh, but two meta-analysis failed to show any benefit. We don't have any specific study in APS, but there's one randomized controlled trial uh, of hydroxychloroquine in pregnant women with, with APS. Maybe we can have some answer in a, in a while. <coughs> Consider the man, ma management. Uh, this is from our protocols, uh, OBSET protocols. Currently, there's no effective treatment that prevents or reverts the progression of placental dysfunction. Several attempts have, been, have failed, uh, like bed rest, nutritional supplementation, antipertensive drugs, and also a lot of other drugs. Delivery represents the only therapeutic option for early fetal growth restriction. We, we want to prevent the consequences of hypoxia and acidosis. However, we have to balance against the harm of prematurity. So that's what our protocols say. And I, uh, what we do in Rio de Janeiro, we have regular ultrasound and Doppler velocimetry studies monthly after 24 weeks. Uh, you are not, uh, most of you are not obstetricians, but you have to remember that if you do a lot of close ultrasound, like every week or every 15 days, you can have overlap results that you, you start to get confused with the, the analysis. You have to be careful with that. If you have something that is abnormal, we can like shorten uh, the evaluation. However, we can like just do the Doppler study instead of doing the ultrasound plus Doppler studies. But it requires an obstetrician with some skills on high risk pregnancy for that. The decision to deliver is the same as no APS patient, and we have to remember the significant association with preeclampsia. Uh, this slide is very confusing on purpose uh, because that's one of the probably 1,000 recommendations that we have for placental insufficiency, how to deal with that. So we and where we can go for a, a meeting and stay a whole um, they talking if we're supposed to do the Doppler in one week, three days, or if the delivery is 34 or 32 weeks. It's very, very confusing and very hard. So like I said, you need obstetrician with skills in high-risk pregnancy to, to work with you and decide the best time for management. Uh, you probably heard about provastin. Uh, we have to remember also that uh, preeclampsia and placenta insufficiency they have a lot of uh, biological and pathological similarities uh, with uh, cardiovascular disease. So uh, when we look to the placenta, like I said, small vessel thrombosis, we have arteriosis and lipid deposition uh, in the telial dysfunction. That's the same thing as the cardiovascular disease that you have in rheumatology or um, on the heart field. But in the obstetric field, we can have that, all that on placenta. So, in patients with APL, have high rates of atherosclerosis. And pravastatin apparently has a safe profile during pregnancy. I have to make very clear this apparently, not a lot, a lot of studies, but the ones that we have, it seems to be safe, but we ha don't have long-term analysis of these babies. So, there is a rationale to use pravastatin, considering the same thing, uh, the same biological and pathological similarities with cardiovascular disease. So there's this one small study, very famous one, 21 women with APS who developed preeclampsia and fetal growth restriction and or fetal growth restriction while they were using low-dose aspirin and low-molecular weight heparin. Uh, 11 of those patients received provastatin, 20 milligrams a day at the onset of preeclampsia and fetal growth restriction. In the treated group, they reached almost, uh, most of the patients reached the term like they start with 23, 24 weeks and reach 36 weeks, that's the median gestational weight for delivery. And the group that didn't have the treatment, the control group, they all had preterm deliveries, the four stillbirths or neonatal deaths, three survivors with abnormal development. So it seems very promising. However, it's a very, very small study. It was not randomized or that it was not clear what was the decision to use on one group or other group. And uh, as obstetrician, we have to be careful because they start the preeclampsia with 30, uh, 23, 34 weeks and goes until 36. It's very weird for us to, to, to see that as common. We don't see that early, preg early placental dysfunction is very, very aggressive. Uh, and going to anti-TNF, 
TNF is a critical effector of abdominal placental development in fetal damage in mouse models. There's evidence that TNF contributes to pathogenic of adverse outcomes in new humans. TNF blockade restores the angiogenic imbalance and spiral artery modeling. E anti TNF agents are available and proven safe in pregnancy. Impact trial is going on. Uh, Professor Branch is probably going to talk about anti TNF in pregnancy in the next talk, so I'm not going uh, very deep here, but we can consider probably in the, the future, as the same thing I said for hydroxychloroquine, we can maybe see if the anti TNF can have some work on prevention or treatment of placental dysfunction. We had some other therapies that we were tried, but unfortunately didn't work. The Sidenafil was the most promising one. Uh, that's for obstetrical, nothing to do with APS, but there were a few trials that failed to show uh, any success. So, uh, in, uh, to sum it up, we don't have very much uh, uh, robust therapies, just we have the preventions that we usually do, but we have to look forward for these new, possible, new possibilities. That's it, thank you.